I greatly appreciate Brother Howard's words. I'm humbled by the opportunity to be your speaker this morning, and I'm excited to share a portion of God's word with you. This morning I want to talk a little bit about leadership. And as I begin, leaders of God's people, as I address you this morning, what gives you the authority to lead God's people? What gives you the right to guide the flock of God? Sometimes we talk frequently regarding character, qualifications, and marital status, and uh, familial obligations and things of the such like, but do these things alone cause God to entrust to you this grave responsibility? I invite your attention to Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews 13 verse 7, there the Bible reads, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. First this morning, brethren, we need to ask the question, who are those that rule over you? Who's being identified here that are being referred to? Because up to this point in the book of Hebrews, uh, we need to realize there's been no mention of specific leadership roles. So to whom is he referring? Well, the word here used is hegeomai. And, with, and this means to lead or to rule or to guide. And that's why in translations like the New American Standard, it's translated as leaders. So why would the writer use this word instead of referring to a specific leadership title, we might ask? Well, I think that we must conclude that this is because the term was being used generically to address more than one church leadership position. Now, he's not creating a new leadership position, if you will, but thankfully we know what the categories of leadership are. From Ephesians 4, verse 11, which says, And he himself, that is Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Commentators like Reese point out that the Greek word hegeomai is used here in the past participial form. That is to say that this is speaking of leaders in their past. And from this verse alone, we know that they possessed four important qualities. They spoke the word of God. They were faithful in speech and conduct. Their faithful words and lifestyles were worthy of imitation. And the outcome of their faith was one that was desirable. Now, if you had to craft a leader in a, uh, in a lab somewhere, I don't think you could find one as good as what's mentioned here. You sound like everything you would want in a congregational leader. They were worth remembering. But the writer shows them how he wants them to interact with their current leaders now in the same chapter in verse 17, which says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now this would appear to be a very straightforward verse. Obey and submit. However, there's a nuance I want to focus on here in the Greek language because the Hebrew writer doesn't use the more common word for obey, hippokuo, that we usually find in Scripture, such as verses, uh, verses like Romans 6, 17, that you have obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, Jesus will take vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. Or even in Hebrews 5, verse 9, which uh, talks about Jesus become the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That is not the obedience that we are called to have for our leaders. That is not the same word used here. The obedience to them is not the same as we have to the Lord. It's not the same as children have towards their parents or even servants, their masters, as the same word is used in Ephesians 6, verses 1 and verse 5. No, the word here is different. The word here is patho. And patho means to convince. It means to persuade or to have trust in. And in fact, in all but seven times in the King James Version, and in all but four times in the New American Standard, it is translated as persuade or trust or confidence. I wouldn't say that everyone now needs to throw out their Bibles because uh, of this one particular word. It's not even entirely without precedent to translate it as obey. But there is a nuance in this word that we should look at very closely. Why was this word used here instead of mere obedience to, uh, to those who are our leaders? 
Let me suggest to you that there is a difference between simple obedience and allowing yourself to be persuaded by your leaders. So again, we come back to our former question. Who is worthy to lead God's people? What gives a person the authority to be heard, to be followed, to be submitted to? The only reason a leader can lead is not because they are inherently worthy of it. Even qualifications of character don't provide the preeminence to lead God's people. Just because you have faithful children or a blameless record with those who you might know, that does not make you a leader or give you that authority because it's not derived from personal merit or accomplishments, but authority only comes from God and the power of His Word. So what do these verses tell us is required from our leaders? Number one, they need to know that the only authority you have is through your power to persuade through God's word. Then that means, of course, that you have to know the word of God yourself and know how to persuade people with it. As important as convincing homiletics and visual aids and passionate preaching are, they aren't as important as knowing how to use the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, "...and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." In Titus chapter 1 verse 9, it talks about elders that hold fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and convict those who contradict. Leaders, know your Bible. That is your source of authority. Know the word of God and know the doctrine. And let them do the persuading. And if you don't know the doctrine, if you don't know the book, then may I suggest this morning that you don't have any business being in the pulpit or being a leader in the Lord's church. But these verses show us other qualities as well. Because number two, you need to be worth following. Be worth following. Now I say this, and I'm going to address our young men um, tonight. Of course, is our young speakers' uh, time, our young men's service. We're excited about that. And there may be many here in this audience who have inspira- uh, aspirations, rather, of, uh, of leadership. And there's going to be plenty of people at big meetings, even your home congregations, who take the proverbial stick. And, when are you going to start leading songs now? When are you going to start wording prayers and, and giving lessons? We mean that with good intentions. We want nothing but the best for you. But let me say two things about that. Please know... That no matter what you decide to do, whether you go on to become leaders in congregations, or maybe you never grace the pulpit, please live a faithful life to God. That is the number one thing, the thing that cannot be lived without. The only thing that matters. And there is plenty of work for you to do for God outside of leadership. That doesn't mean that just because you're not a, a teacher or a preacher that you don't have work to do. But if you are going to take on a leadership role, then you must have the faith and the strength of character that others can follow as well. There have been an awful lot of leaders that could preach the Word, that knew the Word of God inside and out, that had all the attributes you could ever want in a leader, and yet they didn't have the strength of character and faith that was worth following. Hebrews 13, 7 talks about leaders whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Live a life old and young, that is worth following, be an example to the believers as 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 talks about. But number three, leadership is not about power. It's about responsibility. It's about someone who is taking on tall tasks and sometimes unsavory and unwanted tasks that serve the greater good of the gospel and of the church. A leader quote unquote, in a congregation who doesn't take on responsibility outside of a voice that insists upon being heard and an opinion that must be respected in a business meeting, for example, is not a leader. These are individuals that want to exert power without performing any of the responsibilities. Because biblical leadership is entirely about responsibility. Peter explains it so very well in 1 Peter chapter 5 where he says, Nor as being lords over those entrusted 
entrusted to you, but as being examples to the flock. Hebrews 13, 17 says, leaders watch out for the souls of the church, helping them, correcting them, guiding them towards the way that they need to go. At times, that's a very unenviable, <laughs> unenviable position to be in, but a responsibility that is absolutely necessary to aid in the faithfulness of the saints. And those submitting are urged not to make it more difficult than it has to be. It says that would be unprofitable for you. But notice, that doesn't mean that leaders won't continue to watch out for their souls either. It just makes it more difficult. That responsibility, responsibility doesn't go away because it's made harder. Because it's made difficult. And if you want to be a leader of God's people, then you have to be willing to take on responsibility in the church, whether it's difficult or not. Biblical leadership, as is described by Hebrews 13, verses 7 and 17, shows that they need to persuade from the word of God. That's where their authority comes from. They need to be worth following, and they need to take on responsibility. But maybe you're here this morning, and you're not a leader in your congregation. That's okay. But as we go back to our congregations and into the new year, how should you interact with your leadership? Hebrews 13, 17 tells us to allow ourselves to be persuaded by our leaders. That's what that word patho means. So what should persuade the Christian to do what is right? What's the most convincing and compelling argument that a leader can make to those to whom he is trying to persuade? Well, the answer was given to us already in this chapter. Because in verse 7 it says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken to you, uh, spoken the word of God to you. Remember, brethren, we don't just obey our leaders. Because Christianity is not a religion that is predicated on blindly obeying some dude because he has a particular office. Or because he's a smooth talker. And there are lots of folks that are ready to entirely throw their spiritual fate into the hands of charlatans that can charm them with their words. There are some even in the Lord's church that would rather obey blindly than give a moment's questioning thought as to whether it's the truth or not. That will never push back, that will never challenge false doctrine thinking, oh, that respons uh, responsibility belongs to somebody else down the line. There are many that make themselves willingly ignorant of the scriptures because they believe with their whole heart whatever their preacher or their pastor or even their congregational teacher tells them to do. That is not Christianity. Yes, you need to have the ability to be persuaded, but not because you're gullible, not because you're weak, not because you're illiterate of the word of God. We should have the, be the ability to be persuaded by our leaders because we know the will of God because we know the scriptures and we allow ourselves to be persuaded because of our respect and because of our knowledge for the word of God. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 13 says this, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Brethren, we do not obey men in this capacity. We obey God. We submit ourselves to our leaders because they have persuaded us to submit to God's word. Who has the right to lead? Who has the authority? It's those that persuade their followers from the word of God. That's why they lead in the Lord's church, and that's why we submit to them. Thank you.